I think there are just three more people who are about to be admitted. All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the fourth session of the African Lamut Educational Series. Um, as some of you know, my name is Erin Cronier. I'm a member of the Educational Program Committee and very proud coach of um, the Addis Ababa University team, amongst other things. And um, I think just before we start, and I introduce you to our guest of honor, I just want to go through some housekeeping rules because we are quite a number of people on the call today. So um, please do keep your cameras off and keep yourself on mute unless um, you have a question to ask and there will be a portion available for that at the end of the presentation. And in, in that respect as well, we do encourage you to ask questions um, because we know of course, and I'm sure you are all excitedly aware that your claimants memorandum is due in just two weeks time. So please do use this opportunity to ask your questions to one of the experts in this field. Um, if you have a connection issue over the course of the session, but you would like to ask a question, please feel free to put that in the chat and then I will try to pick it up. And if you do not have a connection issue and you would like to ask a question directly, please use the raise hand function or some other kind of emoticon that I understand is now available on the Zoom app. And I will call your name and you can ask that directly. So now speaking of, uh, of the educational series and, and the experts in the field, I would like to uh, turn to our guest of honor. It's with great pleasure that I introduce you to Mr. Matthias Kuscher, who is a partner at De Blau, De Blau Blackstone Westbrook based in Amsterdam, where he practices international arbitration and litigation. And I know that you may think that that is impressive enough all on its own, but that is just the tip of his ice, the iceberg in his extensive resume. Uh, Matthias is also a qualified barrister in the United Kingdom, and he has sharpened all of his advocacy skills over many years and in many complex cases and diverse fora. Um, he specializes in international disputes and international uh, commercial and investment arbitration and multi-jurisdictional litigation, and has acted as lead counsel in arbitrations under the rules of the ICC, UNCITRAL, the PCA, ICSID, the Vienna Center, the Dutch Center, the German Center, the Stockholm and Swiss centers. So I'm sure also that our Mooties will be very happy to hear that some of his experience also includes arbitrations, which had the CISG um, as the applicable law. So in addition to being a first Moot alumnus, he can also vouch for what actually happens with CISG in real cases. And now before joining De Brau, uh, Matthias also worked as legal counsel at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, and he established the PCA's first overseas mission in Mauritius. Um, he has also been counsel in charge of the UK and Commonwealth um, teams at the ICC based in Paris. And even further still, he has acted as tribunal secretary and has sat as arbitrator, although I hope not in the same role and those two same roles in the same case. And for those of you who have come across the rules of conflict and arbitrator's independence, I hope you enjoyed this nerdy joke. Um, so now with that, I hand over to you, Matthias. Thank you very much, Aaron, for that overly generous introduction. Um, sadly, I'm not allowed to write a reply just yet, but um, let me assure you that uh, my meager accomplishments pale in comparison to those of Aaron. Um, and let me also say how pleased I am to, to be here, albeit only virtually, and to see all of you at least in name and in small icons. Um, Africa in the Mood is a fantastic initiative and I'm delighted to play a very small role uh, in furthering the objectives of its educational division. Now, I have prepared um, a talk and much to your disappointment, I suppose, I cannot offer you insights of the same intellectual caliber as perhaps those presented by, by Gary a few weeks ago. 
Uh, in fact, I've been given a rather soft and cushy topic, uh, namely to talk to you about how to use evidence and legal authorities effectively. Now, let me see if I can actually manage to, um, to share my screen. Um, I've sort of, um, I think you should now be able to see the starting slide of my presentation. And I'll preface it by, by making two remarks, uh, one about the photo and one about uh, the title. Uh, the photo is indeed of a younger, much younger version of myself. Um, and it shows to you that for a very long time, from an early age, it was my ambition and my fervent desire to become an accomplished chef. Um, well, and then life happened and I became, became an arbitration lawyer. But my proposition to you tonight is that those two professions are actually more similar than you might think. Because as an arbitration advocate, uh, your job is essentially that of preparing a really tasty dish out of some peculiar factual and legal ingredients to serve that dish to three discerning individuals and to convince them that it's much tastier than the dish created by your opponent. So what I'm trying to teach you tonight uh, is a set of recipes, if you will, um, that should enable you to improve your skills in the kitchen of international arbitration. Now, this is, of course, my respectful submission to you, and that has two reasons. One is that we're two weeks away from the submission of the claimant's memorial, and so by now I'm sure you have yourself determined the best course of action in presenting your evidence and your legal authorities. And the second reason that I'm only making the submission with the greatest possible respect is that, of course, in this mood, at the end of the day, who is in command? Uh, not some guest speaker on Zoom, but your coaches. They have the first and the last word, and you must always listen to them and disregard whatever I say, insofar as it is inconsistent with what your coaches have taught you. And that is not because um, there is some unwritten hierarchical rule in the Vis Constitution, but it is because Ultimately, advocacy also is a subjective uh, task and talent. Uh, and while I might have strong views as to how one could best utilize and present evidence and authorities, that view might not be shared by the arbitrator next to me, um, figuratively speaking. Now, I've broken my presentation down into three parts. I want to first discuss with you, and that might sound a bit strange, uh, who you are uh, and to whom you are going to be speaking. Then uh, I will look at facts and how to present them in your written submissions. And finally, and deliberately uh, at the end, then look at the legal framework and how best to develop that. Now, beginning then with my first part, the orientation part, I'm not going to invite you to reflect metaphysically on, on your existence and your role, but I want to remind you of a, of a very simple but often overlooked fact. When you start to write the memorial and put together a hopefully compelling set of arguments, there are two questions that you have to keep asking yourselves over and over again as you write, rewrite, rewrite review, and rewrite again. And those two questions are, who are you and what exactly are you doing? And the second equally important question is, who is your audience and what are they doing? Those two dimensions uh, of your identity, if you will, uh, shape decisively how you're going to present your facts and how you're going to deploy the law. Turning to the question of who you are and what you are doing, what do I mean by that? Now, I know uh, that you all, of course, are fully aware that you are currently representing the claimant in this arbitration. But that only tells you so much. To be able to craft a compelling factual legal story, you have to be aware and constantly be aware of, of three things. It is your identity as a claimant and not just your role as a claimant, but also 
the company you represent, its activities, its role in the transaction that is at issue in this arbitration, its history, its public reputation, all those multiple facets uh, of the client that you represent. Because of course, you can imagine uh, if you are acting for and representing a state and putting forward a position on behalf of a state, you might want to choose a very different voice and you might want to deploy very different arguments than if you are representing a private company. Likewise, if you are representing a small or medium-sized entity, you might again want to choose a different voice and deploy different arguments than if you are a multinational conglomerate that rakes in billions of dollars in revenues every year. The second point um, that you should always recall is the procedural posture. Um, the Vismut is somewhat artificial, but also uh, not exceedingly so, in the sense that you are here both a party that is asking for something as the claimant um, on the merits, so to speak, but you're also having a particular role to play in relation to the procedural aspects in which you are acting more as a respondent, at least in relation to two of the three elements. And that again, shapes the way in which you act. If you are assertively seeking to establish a claim, or for example, show that as you contend, the CISG applies to the contract here in question, that might sound very different than if you are simply seeking to defeat an application, say, for bifurcation or stay. And third, they're also soft factors, as I've called them more generally. Um, again, perhaps an analogy will, will help. You may have heard of the much publicized uh, climate change litigation against Shell. Now, in that litigation, Shell, given its role, given what the case is about, given the judgment that is already there, might take a very different approach, choose a very different tone, and make strategic choices as to what arguments to ventilate and what arguments not to advance, as compared, for example, to the NGOs who are, after all, defending the earth, uh, and might take a very different approach to developing their story of the case. Now, the second question you need to ask yourself is what is it that you're actually doing here? For some of you, maybe for most of you, this exercise marks somewhat of a transition. You're not writing an academic thesis, uh, trying to establish what the law exactly is or ought to be, but you are drafting a very opportunistic document. The sole purpose of that document is to ask for something and to convince three people that they should give you what you are asking for. So in a very real way, um, you are not anymore in the business of hunting for, for truth insofar as there is such a thing as truth, but you're simply there to get your position, your client across the line that makes it sufficient, if you will, for, for your case to be an ounce stronger than your opponent's case. It's a simple exercise of persuading three decision makers. Now there is of course, and I've put it there deliberately, um, a catch here. While you might not be um, seeking to establish the truth as far as it does exist, you still, even in this mood, have ethical duties that infuse and permeate your task as an advocate, pressing for a certain result. And I'll come back to that dimension later on. Turning to the other side of this important equation, who is your audience and, and what are they doing? And that's perhaps a little more interesting than you might at first think. And the first juxtaposition I would like to present to you is that of a microscope and a telescope. As counsel, we get to enjoy a case 
in all its dimensions. We get to study it, if you will, microscopically. We can contemplate every piece of evidence that we unearth, every document we find under the microscope. The three individuals that you are trying to convince of your position don't have that privilege. They don't look at the case through a microscope. They have neither the time nor the resources to do that. They look at it from a much greater distance, if you will, through a telescope at a very distant star. Now, of course, they have a very good telescope and they can see the star very clearly and perhaps even identify its moons and uh, its, its uh, atmosphere, but they will not be able to zoom in as far as you have been able to. That is true for the moot as well as real life. The people who will read your memoranda and who will meet you in Vienna or Hong Kong, and indeed in the pre-moots, will know far less uh, about this case in factual and, and legal dimensions than you do. And you must bear that in mind when you address them, both in writing and later orally, because you need to, if you will, pick them up where they are. If you start too deep or too high, um, they might not be able to follow you and lose you right from the outset. But there's a more fundamental dimension to this issue, and that is that arbitrators or an arbitral tribunal, even a fictitious one as the one here, are curious beasts. Of course, they are international. Uh, that you know, even in the case file here, the drafters have made sure to, to indicate that the three individuals who are sitting on the panel do not come from the same country and don't share the same background. So unlike, say, a panel of judges in a national court, who tend to be rather homogenous in terms of their background, their education, their experience, their professional parkour, here you have three people who share none of that, who might, in fact, be extremely heterogeneous, come from different legal families, come from different professions, academics, practitioners, and might be in very different stages of their career, if you will. Linked to that is another important element, which is that arbitrators or a tribunal is by definition non-permanent. So unlike national courts and benches in national courts, these people are only here for this one case. So they look at this case as, as, a, as a one of exercise and not as one in a long stream of matters that are simply put in that docket um, by, by a system. And the fourth point is, and that may sound a little bit dangerous, is that arbitrators are fundamentally unconstrained by hierarchy. They don't have an appellate court sitting above them. They don't need to think about whether their award, their decision, will be appreciated by the general public or interested lawyers, and whether they will be able to uh, advance, if you will, and be promoted in the judicial hierarchy. They somehow are suspended in midair. They're not part of any particular judicial system, but are simply existing outside it. Now, of course, there are limits to that. After all, any award might ultimately be set aside, but that's a far more attenuated constraint than that that binds a national trial judge who will be thinking very carefully as to whether his or her decisions might ultimately be overturned on appeal. And what is it that these people are doing. Um, and one thing they're not doing is investigating all the facts and trying to figure out what really happened. Uh, they're not sitting here, if you will, as an inquisitorial criminal court. They're fundamentally there to give what you are asking for if you establish that you are entitled to it. Their business is one of deciding. They need to come to a result and hopefully rather quickly which means that they're thinking about the case from the end, not from the beginning. They're not, as it were, trying to go through the exhibits, and the case file chronologically, one by one, every issue, every footnote, but they'll be thinking about the case on a much higher level to determine what the outcome should be. And then, if you will, reason backwards. They are, as I said, looking at this one case in splendid isolation. 
they have been employed by the parties, if you will, to decide this one case. And once the case is decided, they will be functus officio and they will disappear. They have no long-term institutional interests in this dispute, except to resolve the very dispute in its narrow confines that is before them. There are two elements, though, that counterbalance that. One is, that arbitrators are, of course, increasingly exposed to public scrutiny, even though naturally, at least notionally, arbitration is confidential, and that's one of its alleged advantages. Certain matters, think of investment arbitrations, but also arbitrations that somehow have a public policy dimension, such as allegations of corruption, tend to attract the public interest. And that might operate very heavily on the minds of the arbitrators who will always be cautious and will try to be seen to be acting in a way that does not, if you will, offend broader notions such as, such as public policy. And finally, and perhaps um, least delightfully, arbitrators are human beings. They are commercial operators. They are economically interested, not in the outcome of the case, but of course in their own career, um, as Jan Paulson has legendarily described, certain incentives operate on arbitrators, the incentive to be appointed again in the future, the incentive to be part of the club, if you will, to belong to the international arbitration bar, and those can also be powerful in shaping the way that a tribunal might look at a case. They are not machines into which you simply insert the facts and outcomes an objective and infallible judgment. And that is not all that strange. Um, the, the late Justice Scalia said something about judges, which I think is, is true also for arbitrators, which is that what they want to do is to make a decision that is fair, and produces a result that could be described as socially desirable. And at the same time, in adopting the legal rule that they are applying, in fashioning that legal rule, do that in a way that it could be extrapolated, if you will, to other cases. Um, they are not there to, to simply do justice or equity in the individual case. They're trying to do it in a sense, in a way, uh, that could be generalized, if you will, as a categorical imperative. And they do that, as I said, as human decision makers, and human decision makers are inherently fallible. And that's simply a final reminder of, of what you're dealing with. It is people who are inherently affected by certain biases. And you are, I think, well advised to reflect on what sort of biases generally operate on people when they try and reach a decision. For example, and I've summarized uh, five well-known ones, but I won't go through them all. But let's focus on, on what's known as the extremeness aversion. Um, it's a, it's a well-known phenomenon psychologically. Um, human beings don't like to pick one of two extremes. Um, if they have a spectrum of options before them, and that could be products in a supermarket that are priced from expensive to cheap, they will pick something that is not at either end of the spectrum. They will try and find something that is the middle ground, if you will. You could put it more sharply and say arbitrators are prone to splitting the baby. They are generally disinclined to either establish or apply extreme rules. Why is that relevant to you in your task as an advocate? Well, it does operate, I think, as a check on you as to whether what you're putting forward, be it a statement of principle or a presentation and elaboration of the facts. If that is extreme, if you're advocating for an extreme outcome, you could wonder whether that's going to be terribly effective. Um, because as I say, there is an inherent aversion um, in humans to that. 
Now, of course, it is true that the law is the law and sometimes legal rules have very sharp edges. Um, but I think in a moot and in most real disputes um, that go to arbitration and that are worth fighting over, um, the law is rarely as clear cut as that. And so, if you will, um, if you come across extreme propositions in your authorities or in your arguments, think again whether you have to go there, whether you can legitimately go there, or whether you should not be somewhat more modest in what you are putting forward. Linked to that is the status quo bias. Arbitrate, arbitrators are not revolutionaries. They will instinctively, like most humans, gravitate towards preserving the status quo. Now, again, there are exceptions that confirm the rule, but fundamentally, um, an arbitrator will not be inclined to adopt a rule or apply a rule in a certain way that simply has no precedent or that has not been done before. If you cannot find a way of explaining to an arbitrator why what you are inviting her to do is something that's been done before, is done all the time, and will be done in the future, you will struggle. That might be different for Supreme Court justices. Uh, it's their job, if you will, to figure out what the law is and if needs be, overrule themselves and lower courts to make sure that the law is what they think it is. But that is not the job description of an arbitrator. So again, if you are thinking of pressing a novel legal principle or a novel legal rule, whether it's the CISG or the PCA rules on the tribunal, you might be fighting a losing battle. Now, having reminded you, hopefully, of what you already knew, namely who you are, what you're doing, who your audience is, and what they're doing, let's apply that when looking at both the facts and, and the law. And as I said, I'll begin with the facts. Now, there are three main propositions that I would put to you. One is that you must respect and utilize your closed universe. The second one is that arbitration and mooting, but also arbitration in real life, is about facts, facts, and facts. Yes, there's some law, and we'll come to that, but that is the primary benefit. And the third hard rule I would like to present to you is the old principle that you have to face the music. Let me address those in turn. Now, like any mood, the this mood is, is artificial in that you operate in a closed universe of facts. And unlike in real arbitration, you don't have thousands and thousands of pages of exhibits, witness statements, authorities. You have, in fact, a very slim bundle. That makes it all the more important that you mine that closed universe as much as you can. And when you first go through it, it might seem indeed very thin and very superficial. And that's where the Bismuth rules come in uh, and help you in determining for yourself forensically what the facts are on which you can base your arguments. And the first is a very important but often ignored rule, rule 25, uh, which has various components. And I'll just briefly reiterate the three main ones. One is that looking at the file as a whole, all facts asserted in the file, whether they are in the submissions of the parties or in the evidence, both exhibits and witness statements, but also the body of procedural order number two, are correct as asserted unless they are contradicted. And that's a very important rule because it allows you to figure out by reading the problem very carefully what facts you can present to the tribunal as undisputed and what facts you therefore can invoke, if you will, when you are applying a certain legal rule. 
The second component of Rule 25 is that you cannot introduce additional facts. You cannot make up stuff. However tempting it may be, however much the problem may remind you of a case in, in real life, however much you would like to perhaps refer to current events, global, local, that you must not do. Unless, and that is an important uh, exception in the third element of the rule, what you are doing is simply extending the given facts in a logically, in a logical and necessary way. In other words, you're taking the facts as they're given, and you're simply filling gaps in, an, in a way that is undisputable. I think the examples given in, in the rules are, are very compelling. For example, that suits are made of cloth, but not necessarily of wool. And the second component is you are allowed to rely upon publicly available true facts insofar as they're relevant to the mood core problem. There was once a problem many, many years ago that I worked on, which was all about cocoa beans and the price of cocoa beans. And it was based on the real price developments. And so, of course, um, as Moody's, we were allowed to use that public information. Be aware of, of the stringent approach that the mood takes to that rule. Um, if you stray outside it, you are considered to be in breach of the rules and to be unethical. Uh, and therefore, um, your written submissions will, uh, and also your oral submissions will be uh, discounted. So two reminders. One, re remember the potency of the problem. Make sure you use every half sentence, every comma um, that you can. Make sure you read between the lines insofar as you can logically and necessarily do so, but don't stray beyond that. Now, the second one is perhaps a shocking reminder, uh, especially for those of you who are still students. Um, the great uh, former chief judge of the Ninth Circuit in the US, Alex Kaczynski, put it, I think, better than I could ever do, and said to, to an audience of of practicing laws, by the way, that there's a quaint notion out there that facts don't matter and that you argue about the law. Facts are for sissies. But in his view, and he was an appellate judge, mind you, in his view, the truth is much different. The law doesn't matter a bit, except as it applies to a particular set of facts. We'll come back to that in part three, but it's, it's an important reminder in how you should think about the case. In a sense, in a very real sense, you should be able to line up the facts that you have mined from the problem in a logical and coherent way, such that when a tribunal reads just the facts, it is compelled to find in your favor before it has even looked at the applicable legal principles. That is advocacy. That the way you tell the story, the way you marshal the facts, convinces a, a human decision makers without any legal decoration. Of course, the legal decoration is important. This is, after all, a moot. But your starting point is not really the law, at least not in the thinking process, but it is the facts of the case. Now, When you're thinking about facts, 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 think about it in a structured way and reflect on exactly what is out there. And perhaps whether one can put what is out there in some sort of hierarchy from the perspective of the decision maker. The first thing that a decision maker absolutely loves is undisputed facts, because that means the decision maker doesn't have to do very much and has an easy time. That's why I reminded you of rule 25 of the Vismut rules. A lot of the facts in the file will be undisputed or are deemed to be undisputed. Make sure that you know what they are and that you use that to the fullest effect. There's nothing more satisfying for a decision maker than to be told 
either directly or indirectly in the presentation of the facts, that he doesn't really have to resolve a complicated factual dispute by reference to all sorts of pieces of evidence, but that in fact, that job is, is not necessary. One step down the ladder perhaps are contracts or agreements. Now you might say that's a legal element, but it's also in a very real sense, a factual one. The contract after all embodies the bargain that the parties struck. It is part of the factual universe, uh, if you will, in which the party's subsequent and prior conduct falls to be assessed. So make sure that you use and mind the contract as much as you can. Why do decision makers like contracts? Well, they are a bit like undisputed facts. They have been signed, if you will, by both parties. Both parties agree at least to the contents of the documents, if not its, its meaning. And in a very uh, significant way, the contract, of course, also is the source of the arbitrator's power. The arbitrators are here because, at least that is alleged, the parties agreed to submit their disputes to arbitration. So the contract between the parties that contains the arbitration agreement or the alleged arbitration agreement is the constitution, if you will, of, of the tribunal. And they will look to it and seek to uphold and enforce it if they can. One further step down the ladder, I think most tribunals have an innate preference for contemporaneous documents and certainly a preference for those over testimony. Why is that? Well, because it's the closest thing that you get to being told in an objective way what the parties were doing, what the parties were saying, what the parties were thinking at the time that, say, the contract was concluded, that it was negotiated, that a breach occurred, etc. Now, of course, a lot of time and money is spent on, on witnesses and experts and, and their testimony, but perhaps again, um, because most arbitrators also have a cynical streak, there is a certain trend of, of I think, tribunals gravitating, if they can, to documents, be it letters, emails, notes, that date from the relevant time. And now, of course, witness testimony is helpful and can sometimes elucidate points that are obscure, but if given a choice, most decision makers would look to contemporaneous documents in preference to testimony. And of course, there's much more out there. Uh, even in this file, you will have publications, newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. Once you've categorized what you have, and once you've assembled all your facts, the second step that you need to think about is how far you have to push the facts that you have at your fingertips. This is not a criminal law trial mode, if you will. So your job is not to convince anyone of the truth, or at least what beyond a reasonable doubt is to be considered to be the truth. Um, that would be a tall order. Perhaps, I think, for the most part, um, all you have to do with the facts is to convince the tribunal that what you are pressing for, what your version of the case, if you will, is a more likely outcome than that of the other side. And indeed, there may be elements in, in the file, depending on what the mood asks you to look at, certainly when it comes to, to procedural notions, where you don't even have to establish that, but it's sufficient that you, on a prima facie level, have the better case on the facts, or at least a case on the facts. That is not obviously unfounded. So beware when thinking about the facts, when thinking how to present the facts, beware of putting the bar too high for yourself. Most moot court problems are drafted in a way that you can equally well argue both parties' positions on all the issues. 
and neither party will really have a complete slam dunk um, on all the issues. So in that sense, don't be disappointed if things seem finely balanced. That's very much the way it should be. That's also realistic. And that also works if you think about the legal standards that you are applying. Third, and perhaps the most important piece of advice when thinking about the presentation of the facts. And that is that when I say you should present the facts and mind the facts and marshal them, I mean all the facts. I don't mean only those facts that you think are more favorable to your case. Sir Harold Bowden put it famously this way, facts that are not frankly faced have a habit of stabbing us in the back. And that is certainly true in litigation. Come 9 December 2022, all of you will change identity and become respondents counsel. And if you are given the claimant's memorial of a team that has been selective in its exposition of the facts, has tried to if you will mislead the tribunal by presenting an inaccurate or incomplete overview of the facts, you will have a field day. You will point that out. And what you will do is not only score points on content, on the merits, but also undermine the other team's credibility. Because that is what, what really happens here. Decision makers who are busy, people who have lots of cases uh, to decide, who are flying around the world, maybe jet lagged, take a dim view and rightly so of advocates who are a bit economical with the truth. Not lying, that no one hopefully does, but being economical with the truth. Why? Because it makes your job so much more difficult and it makes you wonder whether you can trust someone who is not prepared to face all the facts and to explain to you as a judge or as an arbitrator why in light of all the facts they should still prevail. That is not to say that you should somehow try to objectivize everything you're saying. You're still there to convince someone, to argue that you are right and the other side is wrong. But you are all the more effective as an advocate if you do that by embracing proactively embracing the potential weak spots of your side's case. And by telling the tribunal that you know what they are, by being honest about what they are, but then explaining why, even though there are these weak elements in the case, you still ultimately should prevail. That's the real advocacy. Now, there are many examples out there the shortest one I could think of is a quote from a criminal brief, where the core point here is that acting for the criminal appellant, you're acting for someone who has been convicted. That's why you are bringing the appeal. And there's no point in denying that you are acting for a convicted criminal. But what you can do while fully embracing that fact, is to put it in perspective. In this case, Miguel Estrada, a famous American lawyer, emphasized rightly that while his client was a criminal, a convicted criminal at that, he had been acquitted of nearly all the counts on the indictment, including the most serious ones. So let that be a, a reminder to you that if you realize that perhaps the claimant's case is not all that strong and that there are powerful arguments for the respondent, do two things with that insight. One, make a note for your next round when you are going to be the respondent's counsel. And now here, think about how to best address that problem preemptively. That's also the case because as a result of the structure of the mood, there is a slight anomaly here uh, in, in, in the way it's set up. Insofar as the arbitration part, if you will, is concerned of the case, the claimant in a very real sense is responding to something 
that the respondent has put forward, namely a jurisdictional challenge and two procedural applications. In the ordinary course of things, in a real arbitration, it would very likely be the case that the respondent would have to present its arguments first on jurisdiction, stay in publication, followed by the claimant. Now, the mood doesn't work that way for all sorts of good organizational reasons. So the claimant here has to address the respondent's case before it's been fully developed. And that is why you can't afford to present either the facts or the law in a selective way. You, you don't have a second round of written submissions. There is no reply, um, some, someone in, in March. You only have this one shot, if you will, and you have to convince the tribunal in this one brief. And you do that by anticipating what core points the respondent might, might advance. Factually, is what is legal. And with that, I turn to the law. Now, the first job uh, that you have here is to understand that your universe is no longer closed, but that it's infinite, like the real universe, and that you therefore have to order it. What do I mean by that? Well, the mood problem closes your universe when it comes to the facts but it does not do so when it comes to the law. It tells you what the applicable law is and it tells you what the applicable arbitration rules are. But beyond that, the legal universe is endless. And it's therefore, I think at times overwhelming uh, what you can dig up in terms of materials and what you could possibly use to develop your legal case. Now, I just tried this morning searching one database, Clue of Arbitration, for the two catchphrases um, that also play a role in the arbitration part of this year's problem, bifurcation and stay of the proceedings. Unsurprisingly, this one engine, and there are many others out there that would yield similarly shocking results, tells you to look at between 800 and 1,100 documents on each of these topics. And it's very tempting to do so. There are lots of interesting articles, anonymized awards, procedural orders, textbooks, commentaries, court decisions, you name it. You could fill binders and binders and binders with what you could loosely label authorities. The worst thing you can do in real life and in the mood is to inundate your tribunal with a random selection of authorities just because you have found them all. Of every type of authority, commentary, monograph, article, award, judgment, there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, that you could potentially cite on the issue of when to order bifurcation or when to say the proceedings. But that will not advance your client's case at all. It will overwhelm and annoy the tribunal. So how do you restore order to your infinite universe? Let's think first about um, the arbitration side of the uh, equation. And I've divided the screen into three parts, but deliberately with dotted lines and one even uh, in gray, because I'm not suggesting there is a formal hierarchy here, I think it's good to remind yourselves of where authorities that you might find belong and how best to, to deploy them. I think your logical starting point and the tribunal's logical starting point in this mood would be the rules and the laws that bind them. So if I were an arbitrator in this year's mood and had to think about a stay or bifurcation, my first point of call would be the PCA rules, I would look at the PCA rules to find out what they tell me about my powers in that respect. And that would be flanked, of course, by the law at the seat of the arbitration, in this case, the, the Ultra Model Law, and to a degree also by the New York Convention. These are my texts. These are the things I know I have to look to, I have to apply them. So 
I wouldn't immediately go to Plume of Arbitration or whatever other database you might find, but I would go to the text of the law. Then, of course, there is an enormous universe of published practice, if you will. I've listed a couple of, of potentially interesting institutions, but all of these from the PCA to the ICC, ICSID, the Iranian Claims Tribunal, Punzer Trial, there is an enormous body of what you could call vaguely arbitral case law. Uh, that is to say, awards or procedural orders that have been published in an anonymized fashion or as extracts. Now, of course, as I said earlier, and I am firmly of the view still, there is no such thing as binding arbitral case law. No tribunal uh, in, a, in a case like this year's case will be convinced if you tell them that they are bound by prior authority. They are not bound by prior authority, at least not when it comes to purely procedural issues such as stay or bifurcation. The story might be very different when it comes to the law at the seat of the arbitration, but that is indeed the only exception. Why is that still relevant, that enormous body of what is loosely called arbitral case law? Well, it's because these are people like the three individuals deciding your case who have done the very same job before. And as I've tried to explain by reference to some of the classic biases that infect our mind, it's comforting if you can tell three arbitrators that what you're asking them to do is the tried and tested thing, has been done before, is always done. And if you can point to decisions or awards that have been published. Now, that is flanked by um, the works of the really clever people um, who write big books. And I've given you four, one of whom you've spoken to, that's Gary, one of whom you'll speak to soon, it's my colleague Albert, and there are others out there, like Ellen Redfern or the, the late, great Emmanuel Gaillard. Now, what, what they have produced is not so much commentary in the, in the classic dogmatic sense uh, that you might know from, from civil law jurisdictions, but they're all seasoned practitioners who have commented on the law, both from a doctrinal perspective, but also very much from a perspective of the practitioner, the arbitrator, the counsel. And so those writings logically carry weight, also operate on the minds of tribunals. You don't want to be seen to be departing from Gary Bourne or Marsman, unless you have very good reasons to do so. And so that is something that, that is equally useful to deploy. But it's a very separate or very different kind of, of authority than an award or procedural order. The other upside or advantage of, of those commentaries is, of course, that they synthesize. Um, it's very easy to, to get lost in the details of an isolated procedural order of an ICC tribunal from 2007. That what Bourne and Marsman and Redfern and Gaillard do for you is to give you a practical sense of more or less how, in practice, a certain problem is approached, a certain test is applied. And that sounds all very abstract, but in fact, this methodology is the one that your predecessors uh, in the mood have used, and especially those teams who've done extremely well at the Britain stage have used and have used well. The this mood website is a great resource because you can look at your predecessors' um, accomplishments and also their work products. And to give you one example, is uh, last year's winning memorandum for claimant produced by the University of Heidelberg. And say on the topic of arbitration, the way the argument was developed was such that in fashioning the applicable legal rule or describing the test, the team made, made sure to invoke and refer to the relevant provisions of the rules or the applicable arbitration law. 
and to develop the details, if you will, of the test or the rule by looking at a selection and quoting a selection of well-known and relevant commentaries, but also critically a careful selection of awards and case law, certainly case law from higher courts. And that's been presented sometimes implicitly, as you can see in the first example, where it's simply, if you just read the authorities, you see that you get a balanced overview or balanced set of references um, and not one that is driven to, to one jurisdiction or an isolated point. And sometimes explicitly by, by calling it out, by saying that a certain position is endorsed both by commentators and by tribunals and indeed thirdly by state courts. And in marshalling those sources, what you can see is a tendency to pick well-known established works and to find awards and judgments that are largely representative, um, both in terms of the institutions they come from, but also the jurisdictions they, they have. As you can see in the second example, the team even made sure to indicate for each case that they were citing as, a, as an authority, the jurisdiction that that case came from, signaling to the tribunal that what they were developing here was a position that is adopted by courts all over the world, from Singapore to Italy, to Japan, to Egypt. The same exercise, of course, can be done and should be done when you look at your legal authorities on the CISG uh, or the UNIDRA principles. Again, your natural starting point as an arbitrator, your Bible is the very rules of the instrument that you are applying. There's no justification for jumping straight into some doctrinal description of the rule without tying that to the origins in the text of either the CISG or the UNIDRA principles. One level below that, you again have extraordinarily rich jurisprudence from a great variety of, of jurisdictions. And I've, I've simply listed a couple of examples here. And I've deliberately picked these uh, courts, not only because they represent a fair spread of, of some of the well-known courts that apply the CSG and have issued many published judgments on the CSG, but also because they are higher courts. And there's a reason for that. And that is that there is so much out there, there's so much that you can access in terms of case law on the CISG that you're sometimes drowning in, in judgments from first instance trial courts to mid-level appellate courts to Supreme Courts. Now, if you think about your international heterogeneous, unconstrained, non-permanent tribunal, insofar as you want to quote authority to them, they're of course less likely to be moved by what the district court of The Hague had to say. When there may be a decision or a judgment of the German Supreme Court out there. So in marshalling your, your CISG case law, constantly ask yourselves, do I have the best authority, the highest authority, the one that's both most on point and most credible, if you will, most authoritative and that I can put forward. And again, you have the really clever people who have written um, the big books that everyone quotes and everyone knows, and you must certainly know the lady on that, on that, uh, of that trio, Ingeborg Schrenzer, whose commentary, of course, is for many people the starting point of their thinking about the CISG, and rightly so. And again, the, the value of those books is, in a sense, that they decode for you the mass of case that is out there. Now, see again what, what the University of Heidelberg did uh, when developing its position under the CISG. They began as they had to and did with the relevant provisions of the CISG. And then they relied and invoked commentaries and case law, again, carefully selected, one commentary or two commentaries, but not more than that, for each principal proposition. 
And that leads me to a second point, which is that when you are setting up your argument, it is critical for you to demarcate the battlefield. That is because you're not writing a dissertation, you're writing an argument. And you, in principle, in any mood, have to convince the tribunal on a fairly narrow point. There's a lot in the case file that is neither here nor there. And you are, you are asked to look often at a very, very narrow point in a very specific way. What do I mean by that? Well, always ask yourselves when looking at the chapter you're writing and looking at certainly procedural order number one, what exactly am I being asked to do here? What is the question or issue that the tribunal wants to have decided? One example of this here is a question of interpretation. Now the tribunal asks you is, and that's a very important operative word, the agreement in question governed by the CISG. That's a black and white question. The answer is yes or no. The answer is not, it depends. And as you all know by now, that question turns on how you read and interpret Article 2 of the CISG. And specifically, what you think Article 2E means and encompasses, and specifically perhaps its last word. Now, if that is the question, if that is the issue that you have to address, that you have to convince the tribunal on, then that dictates in a way how you might want to go about that. Remember what I said earlier, the tribunal will naturally want to start with, like in any case of interpretation of a statute or a treaty, with the text of the relevant instrument. It will want to be educated on the meaning of the words in that text based on a purely textual analysis. It might then want to look at the context. How does that provision and that part of the provision operate in the context of the wider instrument or indeed in the context of the law more broadly? It might then want to hear about how that provision has been applied by other courts and other tribunals. And somewhere along the way, and depending on what tribunal you are looking at, they might want to hear more about the drafting history of a certain provision um, or official commentaries that are out there. So this is a very specific task, but by the way the task is described, the way you should argue it is in a sense, not preordained, but it's very different from a question of, for example, discretion, which you also have in this year's mood problem. Because another question you asked to answer is whether the tribunal should do something, namely stay uh, or bifurcate the proceedings. And the operative word here is should, not whether the tribunal must do that or is obliged to do so. That is not the question and it can't be the question for obvious reasons, but whether it should do so. And what that points you to, and again, you will all know that by now, is that this is essentially a question of discretion. In fact, the PCA rules, which I as tribunal will immediately go to, tell you that, not just in so many words, but directly, that fundamentally those procedural issues, such as a stay or bifurcation, are essentially matters of discretion. Now, convincing a tribunal on how to exercise its discretion is a very different task from convincing a tribunal of the correctness of a certain interpretation of the CISG. And that is because, like most grants of discretion, Article 17 doesn't tell you, at least not conclusively, how exactly a tribunal is to exercise its discretion when it is faced with an application for stay or bifurcation. You may think that Article 17 provides further information on that, tells you what the factors are, uh, but that is part of your submission. 
So what you're developing here uh, as an advocate is a framework of factors that you say should guide the tribunal in its exercise of the discretion. And so your task is twofold. It is first to advocate, if you will, for a set of factors that in your view should operate on the tribunal's mind when it's thinking about the exercise of this discretion. And then in a second step, explain why when looking at those factors, the tribunal should in this case, on these particular facts, come down your way. And in this case, as claimant, um, reject the application for stay in bifurcation. Now, Lord Sanchin uh, once memorably said that whenever you hear a court or a tribunal refer to a multifactorial test, that is simply shorthand for saying we can do what we like. And in a very real sense, that is true. Um, a tribunal can exercise in discretion, its discretion in, in pretty much any way they like. Um, there are some outer limits, due process uh, may be the most relevant one, but fundamentally, um, there is an enormously wide margin of appreciation. And so the battlefield for you is pretty large. You can use whatever facts you can find to categorize them and to create a compelling story as to why the tribunal should exercise its discretion in a certain way. And of course, here, what is critical is not so much a checklist that you might find in commentary A or a long list of factors that you might find in commentary B. They're certainly useful in, 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 in setting you up and setting your argument up in a certain way. But what is really critical here is for you to educate the tribunal on how its peers and its predecessors have exercised that discretion. This is where practice or arbitral case law, if you will, come into play, not just to establish the checklist, as I say, but to educate the tribunal in a very real way that, at least that is now currently your position as claimant, faced with a set of facts like the present one, tribunals would you know, ordinarily decline to stay or bifurcate. Now, I've said at the beginning that the universe the legal universe here in the mood is infinite, uh, and that requires you to be judicious. And the rules don't say that explicitly, but they tell you something which should, in a sense, be a hint as to, as to how much you can credibly cite as authority. And that is rule 47, which in a sense prohibits footnotes and endnotes and forces you to cite to authorities, but also to facts, to the record, uh, to the submissions in the text of the memorandum, in square brackets, as you just saw when we looked at the Heidelberg memorandum. Now you can imagine, if you read a text, it is incredibly disruptive for the reader if suddenly in the middle of a sentence, there's a square bracket, and then there are three or four lines of authorities, one after the other, all the commentaries and all the cases you could find from every jurisdiction on the planet. That would be bad form and bad advocacy. So in a sense, this formatting rule forces you already to be economical and pick the authorities that you think are the best that you have. You also have to be judicious in another sense, which is make sure you know what exactly it is that you're seeking to establish. Because if the proposition you are advancing is a trivial one, or one that follows directly from, let's say the text of the PCA rules, a citation to authority would be not only counterintuitive, but bad practice. Let's take as, as an example the proposition that under Article 17, one of the PCA rules, a tribunal has discretion on how it conducts the proceedings. Now, 
you can find that statement in many commentaries. And I'm sure you can find many published procedural orders in which um, a tribunal will have said something along those lines. But do you need those authorities to advance that proposition? Well, my answer would be no, because that proposition you can find and derive directly from the very text of Article 17 of the PCA rules. So make sure that only when you come to a critical and disputed point that you are advancing, you then support that with authority. You don't have to cite Galileo Galilei as authority for certain propositions about the earth and the cosmos. The second dimension of judiciousness is looking at the authorities themselves. As I say, there are dozens, if not hundreds of textbooks and commentaries, and there are even more awards, judgments, orders out there that you can tap into. As in the best evidence rule, I think there is a rule such as the best authority rule. Pick the two or three best authorities that you have and don't use all 25. I know it was hard to dig them up and to find them and to mine them, but you must make that choice. Not only because, as I said, it's bad practice to bombard the tribunal with pointless authorities, but also for another reason. The more exotic, the more, if you will, far-fetched the authorities that you assemble in a very long string of authorities, the more doubtful, I suppose, uh, an arbitrator would be that the proposition you're advancing is, is actually true. If it were true, he would or she would think, you should be able to point to one or two of the leading commentaries and perhaps one or two of the leading cases, and that should be it. But if you have to point to some obscure judgment of the district court of The Hague, the arbitrator might feel that you're probably in trouble and that perhaps the proposition you're advancing is not as clear as you make it seem. So be judicious. Finally, a word on how to use authorities. There's a tendency, certainly at the outset of the drafting phase, to concentrate on amassing citations and being able to support every proposition that you have with a nice string of authorities. And that is good and important, but it is not, and it cannot be the end of the matter. Let's look again at two sections of the Heidelberg Memorandum from the last note. This is the arbitration section and I think the issue was which law applies to the arbitration agreement. And in paragraph 14, what the team did is it develops the rule, the general rule, which law applies, the law of the seat or the law of the contract. And in developing and, and framing that rule, they cited to various authorities. And we looked at that very same paragraph earlier. And I told you they picked three well-known commentaries, a couple of good awards, and then a nice range of judgments. So this is when you establish the rule, when you establish the test the tribunal is to apply, you cite. But the team didn't stop there because a rule established like this is pretty sterile and pretty general. It doesn't tell the tribunal very much um, as to how to go about looking at a complicated case because if this were a simple case, we likely wouldn't be here. So that is the second layer that the team uh, integrated here, which is when applying the rule and explaining how to apply the rule, the team reasoned with the authorities. They didn't just cite, in this case, the first link case from Singapore, but they then went into detail and gave the tribunal a sense of how exactly 
one does what they're saying here the rule compels you to do and what factors and what thinking process a court or a tribunal in fact should go through so they cited to establish the rule and then they reasoned when teaching the tribunal how to apply that rule. and they went one step further which is they engaged with if you will the big cases in order to defend the rule or the result and here in this case it happened to be a well-known uh, judgment of the English Supreme Court, which they addressed in detail and explained at, at, at a length of almost one full page. Now, why is that engagement so interesting? Well, it actually teaches you another lesson I, I sought to draw out earlier. The claimant in this case was also, in a sense, responding on the issue of the applicable law. And Anka, on one reading of, of, of the judgment, was an authority unhelpful or potentially unhelpful to the claimant. But the claimant here, Heidelberg, did not ignore it and pretend it didn't exist and simply use the authorities such as first thing that were more helpful to it. But they spent even more time and more ink with the one famous decision that they could anticipate the respondent would put front and center. And preemptively, if you will, explained why rather than helping the respondent, it actually helped the claimant. So that is, I think, a critical lesson in handling authorities. By all means, cite them when you establish a rule but then go those two additional steps of reasoning with them and engaging with them when you apply and defend the rule to reach a certain result. That is advocacy. Citing rules or citing authorities is helpful and useful and the necessary starting point, but it in a sense stops, if you stop there, you stop before you're making an argument. And that is, I think, what mood and real life are all about, the argument itself, based on the facts, which we looked at in part two, and the law that we just looked at in part three. And with that, I close my submissions, respectful uh, as I commence them, and would be very happy to have a chat with, uh, with you about what you are struggling with, if anything and what questions you have for me. Matthias, thank you very, very much for your presentation. I hope that the teams had their volume up and could uh, take note and live that sponge-like life and just take in everything that you've shared with us. Um, certainly there's a lot of wisdom, so we really, really appreciate that. We have a couple of questions in the chat, and I actually have a, a couple of my own, hence the, the ongoing learning process that we are all in as, as different levels of seniority in practice. Um, one of the questions from the chat is, uh, can you give an example of a contemporaneous document and perhaps um, just elaborate a bit on the relevance in the hierarchy of, of sources and evidence of a contemporaneous document? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I'll keep my microphone on. Yeah, I'm not sure I can give you an example from this year's problem, because I don't know the problem well enough, uh, being an ill-informed arbitrator. Um, but I think generally what, what a contemporaneous document would be is, for example, if you think about the negotiation and conclusion of the contract, contemporaneous documents would be drafts exchanged at the time, correspondence between the parties at the time about the contract that they were about to conclude, notes prepare, prepared internally of meetings held at the time. That I think is, is what we generally understand to be a contemporaneous document. I think it's, it's just about the entire universe of evidence at a certain time. And I think the question is always, what time is relevant? Uh, if, you, if you're having a fight about what a certain term in a contract means, I think you tend to look at documents that have been prepared or were prepared 
at the time of negotiation and conclusion, because that might give the tribunal the best insight into the party's minds, if you will, uh, at the time that is relevant for that exercise. Okay, thank you. I think um, I have, before I move to the next question, uh, does anyone want to put their hands up and maybe pose a question directly to Matthias? We'll look for, I hope that the icons will light up. Ah, there's, an, there's a hand up from Asim. Do you want to pose your question? Hello. Hi. Uh, thank, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I know there's just two weeks left before our um, final deadline, but there's still we can, a lot we can implement before before that and just re-strategize re as we think about what you've told us. Uh, my question is to do with, um, like, as you gave towards the end of your talk, the engaging of what you have said and you try to engage it with the case and your case in present. So what I have um, a hard time doing is drawing a parallel between a case that I've cited and my case. Yeah. I feel like um, sometimes I may not have the authority to make such a parallel. For instance, um, if Professor Gary Bond, for instance, makes that parallel, he comes from a state of, um, he know, like, you know, he's, he, he has an authority, right? But me, I'm just a mere student. And when I'm making such a parallel, how do I make it so that it's, it's not just my opinion of something, it's I'm actually trying to make a reference and trying to bring a parallel between these two cases and show they're similar. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think um, reasoning by analogy or, or trying to, to show that your case is similar to one that was decided before is kind of a classic common law um, technique, right? Um, and its success does not depend on um, what you're called and how much experience you have. Uh, its success depends on your ability to dissect the authority that you're thinking of, uh, and to find a way of, of presenting the operative considerations that move the court in a certain directions, or the decisive facts. And I think that's, that's part of your job as an advocate to think about that. And then um, a, a valid comparison to a factual element in, in the mood case. I mean, you will not find likely a case that is exactly like the one in that mood that, that you now have. Um, no two cases are alike. And that's exactly the, the, the fun, that it's, it's sort of artistic license, if you will, um, to, to do that and to see if you can read a case, read a judgment, and draw out uh, the things that help you and use them in an effective way. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Um, it, uh, I think it's, it's, to a degree, it's trial and error, um, <laughs> I have to say. But perhaps one, one thing that does help, uh, in addition to trying to compare your case or elements of your case to a published decision, is to think more broadly of, of trends. So you, you could ask yourself, um, let's look at the respondents' request here, right? So they, they say, we want to bifurcate something. Huh? Um, the question of whether the contract is valid um, because of all these corruption allegations. Now, you could try and look at the published cases that you know and think, well, has that ever been done? Has someone, has a tribunal ever done it in a way whereby they first decided jurisdiction and part of the merits, and then they deferred consideration of a second part of the merits um, to a much later stage when there was a corruption allegation? floating around. Now, if you can't find a case like that, if you can't find an authority like that, you could, for example, say that, well, you know, this is novel. This is a, an attempt that, you know, is so strange that it's not consistent with the normal approach to bifurcation, which is front-loading jurisdiction <clears throat> and then doing all the merits together. So, so there are ways of doing it in a, in a way that don't force you to, to compare decision by decision because you don't have the space for that, right? Um, but that, that allow you to put your facts in, in the broader context, if you will. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great. And we have another question. Um, if for people who are new to international commercial arbitration, 
how do you know or how do you identify the leading authorities in terms of the commentaries? Yeah. Well, you've spoken to one of them, Gary Bourne. Um, I think, in, in, in a sense, a database like like Clue of Arbitration or um, the average bookstore would, would give you a first indication of, of what the big books um, are. Um, and I think Gary Bourne is, is one of them. It's certainly the most comprehensive work that there is. I mean, there is very little that you can't find in Gary Bourne's treatise. Um, of course, you have uh, Red Fun Hunter, also uh, very well known. I, I think I even have a copy in front of me. Um, so I'll show it to you. Um, much, much uh, thinner than, than Gary Bourne. Uh, and, and then you have a range of other works. Uh, you have Albert's book on international arbitration, Albert Marsman's book on international arbitration. You have uh, Fushan and Ayan Goldman. You have Loomis Ellis Crow. I think that's the famous range. What's a shortcut? Read last year's winning memorials. Um, they tend to, at least in terms of the, the commentaries, they tend to contain pretty much everything there is and every every big thing there is. Now, of course, they contain lots of things that are not relevant to, to your problem now, but in terms of the, the big books, they will generally be, be in there. So they are a good pointer, I think, to the leading works uh, in international arbitration. Thank you. And I actually have a follow-up question on the topic of commentaries itself. Um, can you give more insight on the use of commentaries um, as a legal authority, especially in the hierarchy of sources? Yeah, um, I think you have to be careful with that. Um, in, from, from my uh, taste, they're a bit overused um, by teams. In the, that's logical. It's an educational exercise, so obviously you use them. And I used Heidelberg as an example, not because they won, that's one of the reasons, but also they're a civil law team. So they're used to, if you will, starting with the commentaries and then going from there. Um, I think, in, as I say, in international arbitration, there is no such thing as one set of rules or laws. Um, it's a rather diverse crowd. Um, but what these commentaries do, and I think Bourne is the best example, uh, is that they sort of very faithfully summarize um, and, and synthesize the practice that's out there, the decisions of state courts, the decisions of tribunals, and, and if you will, provide you with access to that, that range of, of, of practice and authority that is out there. So I, I would use Bourne um, in that way, not as the, the start, starting point and end point, but as a gateway into um, the specific detailed authorities that there are. But of course, they, they carry weight precisely because he's looked at all those cases. Um, so in a sense, um, he doesn't express strange or extreme opinions. He simply sort of summarizes the state of play. And as a result, he is, I think, considered to be a, a reliable guide. But he's not going to provide you the answer to every hard question. That is still in a process of refined reasoning, using him as, as, as your first port of call, but then developing the argument based on the authorities you find, such as cases or, or, or further writings on a more detailed level. Thank you. There are a few more comments, uh, well, questions in the chat box. Um, I'm going to give the opportunity to some of the writers to ask the question themselves, so you don't just hear my voice. Um, otherwise I will read them out, but does anyone have accessibility to, to ask the question? Looking for hands up. Ah, there's a hand. Mark. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the good talk. And I'll just go straight to my question. Question was. How is it uh, convenient to cite a string of legal authorities to support an argument and show how they correlate and apply to the facts of the case for, especially to those who use like a Syriac format of um, responding to or writing a memorandum to respond to arguments and uh, issues that they are supposed to write on? 
Well, if you if you if you use a, a Syrac method, um, then well, let's let's leave aside. I think um, the C and the I, the conclusion, the issue. I think th those tend to be uh, drafted in a way that does not involve citation to authority. But the R element, the rule uh, element, is is where you would bring out. Um, I think, as as I showed by citations, um, what the rule is and what the, what the components of the rule are. I think there you tend to to cite to certain authorities. You might even quote parts of them. I think that's certainly U.S. teams like that a lot, and it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a technique that's used in the U.K. and the U.S. a lot. Of you are trying to phrase the rule in a way that is very closely aligned uh, with 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 the authorities, and you pick your authorities, I guess, in order of seniority. Right? You go to the most authoritative commentary, you go to the highest court, and you go to the, I guess, most well known jurisdiction. Uh, slash article institution that you have. And then in the A, the application uh, component of CIREC, uh, that is, I think, where you do what I said, reasoning and engaging with authorities. That's where you, certainly on the, on the sort of core neuralgic points of your case, you'll try and, and, and draw in the tribunal and say, look, I'm reasoning this through for you. This is how you should apply the rule. And I'm doing that by reference to how the rule has been applied in the leading or one of the leading cases uh, or the most helpful case for you. Uh, I think that's where you then dive in a bit further. I think it's the same for the oral argument later on. That's where you really show that you are working with, with the authority. I mean, don't think that, that that's always possible, right? That, that isn't achievable on every issue. There are some issues that are so fact intensive um, that you can't really meaningfully uh, do the exercise. Huh? I think that, that tends to be the case uh, when, the, when the CISG is concerned. Huh? You often have issues that, you know, once you've explained what the rule are, it's, it's really just about putting the facts in a certain way uh, and subsume them under the rule. But if you can, um, you would do the, the reasoning and engaging part in, in, in the A of, of CIRA. Thank you. And now we have a, a kind of a, oh, sorry, Mark, did you have a follow-up question to that? No, I just said thank you. I, I got it. Okay, great. Uh, we have a, a bit of a, a chicken and egg type question um, from the chat. The, it is, is it wise to have predetermined arguments based on logical attack points and find supporting authorities or start from available authorities and then design your arguments accordingly? Yeah. In, in, in a sense, both. Uh, that's the that's the unfortunate answer. Um, why is why are both avenues I think valid and helpful? The first one is well, if you um, think about it in a sort of purely intuitive way and, and ask yourself, what facts would I want to use to tell my grandmother that she should not stay this arbitration? Uh, she doesn't know Gary Bourne. She hasn't read the ICC bulletin, but. What factual circumstances in this case about the corruption investigation and all that, what should I use um, to say to her, don't press the pause button? And I think most of us, especially given that we are clever lawyers, we can come up with, with factors that we can find in the case file. We can think, oh, look, you know, it seems like the allegation is pretty weak, it doesn't affect the conduct here at issue. It seems like you could have your doubts about whether the process in the country that is investigating the corruption is actually sound or whether it's rather political and, and therefore uh, not likely to yield a kind of a, a helpful reliable outcome you could have a view about um, how fair it is to to wait for two or more years for that process to run its course i think all those things you 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 stumble across when you read and reread the case file and you can you can String them together before you've even looked at whatever Gary Bourne has to say on when you should stay in arbitration. At the same time, it's it's I think useful then to look at at the commentaries or, or decided cases and figure out what framework tribunals have used or authors have proposed to analyze um, a, a problem or a case, because you might be reminded of aspects that didn't jump at you in the case file. And when you then look at those checklists and those multifactorial tests, as, as Will Sumption put it, 
you might be triggered and think, oh, actually, I, I saw something about that in the case file, right? Um, so I think approach it from both ends, and, and you're likely going to uh, reach the best the best result. Right, and linked to uh, the topic of selection of sources, um, you mentioned earlier about the importance of knowing your audience, so the importance of knowing your tribunal members and what will be most persuasive to them. So how does that interact with your choice of authorities or evidence? And to support that, um, you know, for example, there is a popular arbitrator, particularly in investment um, arbitrations, who has said that she doesn't think that witness evidence is particularly reliable and doesn't have much interest in reading witness statements. Um, and of course, there are other examples of arbitrators who come from particular jurisdictions um, where maybe in their training, they rely more heavily on certain authorities. So for example, case law. So in terms of finding the best authority, do you opt for sources that are more comfortable to the tribunal or um, do you do what you think is simply best for your case and hope that the tribunal goes with you in those sources? Um, yeah, and just hope that they accept that. Yeah, now, so, so of course the, the mood is again a bit necessarily artificial in the sense that you don't have a real tribunal here. But what they've done is they have told you that they are uh, not, not all from the same legal background, if you will, right? So, so they're not all common lawyers, and they're not all civil ones. So in, in a sense, what they're, what they're doing there is they're allowing you to, to do whatever you like. Um, but I think you would be ill-advised to choose one method to the exclusion of the other. So if you draft a pure sort of heavily civil law leaning brief where you go straight to the, the commentaries and if you cite a case, it's only the German Supreme Court and nothing else, um, you might be criticized for losing, if you will, the common law arbitrator who would be thinking about the case rather differently. So that's that's the sort of the skill set that has been tested here that you are having to appeal to a rather heterogeneous audience. Uh, and so you, you should do it, I think that's what the Heidelberg team did, um, in a way that's that's acceptable and helpful to both. As you saw in those few excerpts, they they certainly made sure that the commentaries were there. So a civilian arbitrator would feel like, oh yes, the, the, the big luminaries have taken this view so I can subscribe to it. They also cited to authorities. They made sure that there was a spread of common law and civil law jurisdictions and it was you know, multiple continents and not just you know, one corner of, of the world. And then they also reasoned in a way that was you know, both on one level academically, but also heavily engaging with, with the case law and, and you know, in a sense, managed, I think, in that way to please most people who practice international arbitration. Great, thank you. Yeah, should, we should, you know, if you have a brilliant point, by the way, yeah, let's just be clear, if you have a killer authority uh, that you really think uh, advances your case and pushes it across the finishing line, you must use it uh, and you must make it as strong as you can, even if, it's, even if it is a district court of The Hague. If, it's, if, it's, if, it's, if you think this really is killing it and this is the best I can find or the most analogous uh, example I can find, you, you push it and you explain why it's such a great authority. Uh, you don't pretend it comes from the US Supreme Court, but you, you sell it, if you will, to, to the tribunal. Yes, thank you. And I think, well, I have one more question for I see on the chat. While I ask that, perhaps uh, everyone on the line can take the opportunity to think of other questions. Ah, oh, before I ask it then, I see Conradus from Mzumbe has his hand up. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I had one question, especially on the part whereby he, um, there was an explanation about the discretion of the arbitral tribunal. And so far as I was listening, I actually realized that the much more comparable advice that was given was so that it can be able to advise the arbitral tribunal on persuading them on the discretion is the use of the case law has authority. Now my question is, can is it only limited to use case laws in such matters of being able to persuade the discretion of the tribunal? And if not, how far or how, yeah, how far can other authorities be used in such kind of argument that you need to persuade the arbitral tribunal's discretion on a certain matter or factor that you've presented, especially when you're considering who your audience is. 
Yeah, no, I think I think um, um, you're right. I think you you use authorities or ample case law um, wherever you can, uh, not not only in relation to to matters of discretion. I think what what's what's unusual about discretion style uh, arguments is that there's no right or wrong, if you will. Um, it's it's an open ended, open textured exercise, and so for a tribunal to to come down one way or the other. They're going to be concentrating heavily, of course, on the facts, on the equities of the case, if you will. And there it's, it's of course, extremely helpful if you can tell them, uh, look, this is how other tribunals, people you may look up to, um, have approached the exercise of their discretion in other cases. This is the, the, these are the facts that they found compelling, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's, that's just a, an example of an area where you might want to use authorities, especially um, creatively. But I think authorities also play a role in, in other parts. So if you look at the interpretation question I, I just flagged. Now, of course, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a classic common law mood problem, right? So what's an aircraft? Is a drone an aircraft? Yes or no? Now, you might find uh, a plethora of decided cases that, that further elaborate the meaning of the word vessel or aircraft or whatever in Article 2E of the CISG. And so you would use those cases uh, as well. You wouldn't use them to inform the tribunal of how they should exercise a the discretion. They're not looking at that point there. They're looking at a, at a yes or no answer, if you will. But you would reason by analogy. Right? If, you, if, if there's a court who's decided that you know, aircraft means um, powered by you know, engines of a certain magnitude, you would say, well, look, these drones have smaller engines. If you find uh, courts that have explained the purpose of, or the reason behind Article 2E, you would again use that perhaps to, to find a way for saying, well, Article 2E does not encompass drones. Um, likewise, if you find materials from, you know, the drafting history of the CISG that could, for example, inform you on why that strange exception was included, you would use those authorities to buttress your argument that drones shouldn't be covered. That's not a discretionary point, right? You're not saying this is how you should uh, think about deciding it, but it's, it's purely giving data points and saying, here is where you draw the line between Article 2E and, and drones. So I think use authorities wherever you can, but the way you use them is slightly different. Uh, one type um, of, of situation is where you are telling the tribunal how to work through the problem in a certain way, how to manage the proceedings. And another set is, is far more black and white, how they should interpret a provision in the contract or a provision in, in the CISG. Thank you. Annie, I see your hand up. Um, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes, thank you so much for the rich discussion. It has really, really been very informative for me. Um, my question concerns actually something similar to what you were saying um, about, um, um, th this is a, a, my question concerns, oh, pardon, sorry. Um, my question concerns um, the use of authorities and especially rule 47 of the modules that you quoted on being economical with the authorities. Isn't it a case that the more authorities you have help you to bring your case out stronger, especially in especially let's say on that on that issue of the CISG being applicable to the purchase and supply agreement, um, in trying to in trying to advance your argument through analogy, wouldn't referring to more jurisdiction, especially in the different cases, would not it advance your case better? And in this way, would not rule 47 be sort of um, an inhibitor in your in your process? Yeah, no, no, I think I think um, you can do both, right? I think what what uh, 47 uh, kind of prevents is, if you will, is um, you just listing authorities in a very long stream because, it, you know, Tribunals are lazy, um, and a, a string, a pure string of authorities as such, uh, will not impress them. So I think what, what, what you're saying, Ani, I think, is that you would want to use these authorities uh, and, and show how courts have applied Article 2E and 
what they have done. Now, and of course, that's that's exactly what you're supposed to do. And that I think is not inhibited by rule 47, because that is then the reasoning and engaging element that I said, pick cases, pick whatever three that are the, the strongest ones and, and work them out. Um, but I think avoid simply, you know, saying sort of rather conclusory, drones are not covered by Article 2E because aircrafts, you know, are X, Y, and Z, and then put in brackets simply a long list of cases. I think that's that's way less powerful than if you have your general proposition with a few authorities there, but then go into more detail, if you will, on, on the ones that you think are most helpful, most advantageous for you, most authoritative. So by no means stop using authorities, but just use them, I think, in, in, in different ways and at different points and resist the temptation to, to show everything that you have in, in one long string. I think I'd, you know, I'd break it up, if you will. And you saw that in the, in the Heidelberg Memorandum, you saw that too, right? So they didn't refer to, for example, ENCA uh, in their initial statement of the rule. Uh, they, 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 they established the rule and then they worked through it and then they zoomed in on a couple of cases, first link and then ENCA. Um, and that's, I think, a very attractive way of doing it. Thank you. Uh, Conradis, I saw your hand go up briefly. You know, it's come back down now. Do you have a question? Yeah, I had a follow-up question and I think I also developed another question as well. So I have two questions. Um, the first question on the follow-up on the response you gave me, um, I wanted to ask further that on the issue of, I have understood that on the issue of discretion and in order to persuade better because how you use legal authority is going to be different according to how your argument is. But is it also can from the authoritative, the authoritative writers that you have actually provided us, like let's say Gary Bourne or Stephen Crow or the others, um, if you think that there is an authoritative writer who actually has written something that can have a persuasive, a persuasive way of being able to being able to persuade the arbitrary tribunal in the in the any matter that is a factor of discretion can that be applied and also my second question is that is it safe to actually use a single legal authority throughout your memorandum like i only used cases and i haven't used any authoritative writer or anything else i did not use a commentary but it's only cases it has an example yeah okay so so i'll take them in turn i think the first one I think totally. I mean, having Gary Bourne as your friend is a, is a great thing, right? And, and, and being able to say to the tribunal that, that the view that you are trying to convince them of is, is the one shared by Gary Bourne, or that he, he is the proponent of that view is going to be extremely helpful. But I think the, the, the answer then is connected to your second question, which is, um, but that can't be it, right? You, you can't write a memorandum using only uh, Gary Bourne's book and saying every time you 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 have a proposition to make every time you you hit a certain point uh, you always refer back to Bourne that would I think look rather weak to the tribunal because if that's all you have then well um, you probably haven't haven't gotten a very good case given that you haven't managed to find anything else uh, and likewise if you only cite to cases some tribunals might wonder whether that's um, reflective indeed of, of the strength of your case and of the position um, in, 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 in the field. I mean, on the CISG, for example, um, you could have a debate on, on whether it's indeed sound only to look at cases, given that they are always decided in a certain national context, right? So it's, of course, lovely if you have many cases of the German Supreme Court that, that help you, but well, um, um, we're not having a case decided here by a court on, or a tribunal under German law. So I think that there, there is a good reason why I think the mood encourages you to, to look at, at the full range of authorities um, and then make a selection. And as I try to show by reference to uh, an old memorandum, just use that mix uh, because you're most likely to, to make the tribunal happy with it or make the greatest number of arbitrators from the greatest number of backgrounds happy with it. 
that goes back to Aaron's point earlier, right? We have a, a heterogeneous tribunal here. There's a, a civil laws on this tribunal. There are common laws on that tribunal. You have the same in Vienna. Uh, when you go to Vienna, you will be pleading in front of very mixed benches. They're always deliberately mixed. Uh, so you will have a common law, you have civil law, you have everything in, in between. And so to, to make them more equally happy, you will have to manage rather carefully your, your cocktail, your mix of authorities and, and don't put all your eggs in, in, in one basket as it were. Annie, I see your hand is up. Um, thank you again. Um, my question, my second question concerns um, the fact, especially Rule Twenty Five, that limits us to the that limits us to the bundle that is presented before us. Yeah. And um, you said yes, you stated earlier that Rule Twenty Five helps us discern between the uncontested facts and the facts in in contention. Yeah. And you said something about extending facts in an in an undisputed way. And I was yeah. wondering if you help me with like a scenario in which I can extend facts. Yeah. Um, in which I can extend my facts. Yeah. So so I think the I didn't give you the full text of Rule Twenty Five because it's quite long. But they give two examples from previous moods, and maybe they are they are helpful. One example is I think the fourth mood was concerned with. Um, men's suits, the delivery of a shipment of suits to a store somewhere, I have forgotten the details, but it's all about suits. And, and there it was permissible and logical to assume that suits like the one I'm wearing are made of cloth. They are, I mean, you know, they're not made of aluminum or, uh, or another material. So that was, a, that, that was a permissible extension, if you will, or logical extension, because that is simply true as a matter of common logic, and that's just reality. What the mood says would have been impermissible is to say, well, all suits must be made of wool, because that is not the case. This suit is not uh, made of wool. So that would have been an impermissible extension of the, of the, of the facts. In a sense, it would have limited the facts uh, impermissibly. Um, the second example the mood gives is the cocoa bean example. That, I think, was the 12th uh, moot. Um, and there they said, well, the moot problem was, was about a certain period, um, a, a real period, right? I think 2003. And it was about um, the global market, the real global market for cocoa beans. And there were certain price movements uh, on that market. And that, that, that's simply reality. Uh, there's no dispute about that. That you can you can Google if you will, and you can figure out what the world market price for cocoa beans was at any given moment in that in that year. So again, in that mood, the the problem was not full of facts about the price movements, um, because that is simply the background in reality that the problem had. So teams were allowed to integrate into their arguments whatever they could find about the real price movements. Uh, in cocoa beans from one day to the other. So those are examples. I think that, that in this particular case here that we have in, in, the, in the 30th mood, I think there, there are fewer such elements. I mean, there's, we're not talking about a fictitious country and a fictitious company um, and, and corruption there. So, so I think there's nothing real uh, about that that you can say, well, actually, this corresponds to developments in, in a real country. But I think you, you, you can um, draw inferences uh, from, from the facts or invite the tribunal to draw inferences from the facts um, that, that don't go quite as far as, as um, pretending as though it's, 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 it's a real country. So um, that I think is the answer. And those are the examples that, that the mood itself gives. And don't, don't forget also to play with um, the empty chair or the absence of evidence or the absence of a fact. Huh? You, you have, of course, uh, the, the respondent has <clears throat> presented its case. They have adduced certain evidence. And that's the evidence by reference to which the tribunal has to make a determination. You can, of course, point out that they don't have evidence for X, they don't have evidence for Y, or there's no witness statement by Mr. So-and-so, or that there's no indication or not even an assertion of certain relevant points. So 
in a sense, you, you can also try and use the, the non-existence of a fact uh, or the non-existence of evidence uh, to your advantage and, and deploy that. That's actually quite a, quite a typical move in, in, in real practice. Um, and it's um, one that's, that's open to you as well. And it's often you're so busy trying to figure out what the facts are that, that you then leave unexploited an evidentiary hole in the other side's case. Thank you. I think we have one more question from the chat, but before I submit it to you, I respectfully request your leave to do so. Um, oh, are sure. You, with time? Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'll put this question first and then we'll see if you, uh, I'll request leave again to see if you can take then Conradus's question too. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. I think this is, a, it's a sequencing of argument question and I think quite appropriate yeah. and relevant in light of the fact that the teams will soon switch their hats, so to speak, to become a uh, respondent's counsel. Um, the question is, do we have to present all opposing arguments and strive to argue against them just as we presented all the facts? So I, as I understand that, um, knowing the, the person who posed the question, is it uh, that when you are responding in the respondent's brief, do you have to attack claimant submissions, sort of submission by submission, and do you have to also address all of them? Um, yeah, so, so I think if, you, if you're thinking about the respondent's brief, so so 9 December onwards, um, I think the answer is, is yes. Uh, you are expected to engage with, with a full a range of, of submissions made in the very memorandum that you get to respond to, right? You're, you're, you're sent one and that is your opponent, if you will. You also meet them in Vienna in, in, in one of the first two rounds. Um, so the answer to that is yes. Um, there's an important addition, I think that's also in the rules, by the way. I didn't put that on the screen, but it is in the rules. There's an important addition in, this, in the rules, which is that if you think that the particular respondent you are getting, if you will, huh, has not made some arguments, big arguments that you want to, sorry, a particular claimant that, that you see has not made a certain argument, um, you are allowed to um, also respond to that, even though it's not there. Huh? I think that the rules even give you an example of how you would do that. Because it's, it's of course possible that, that your opponents might miss a really big thing in your view and you want to address it. Um, now, for both points, of course, it's it's always true that as, as an advocate, you have a certain degree of, of artistic license, right? You you don't have to go through your respondents to your to the claimants' arguments in exactly the way and sequence that they are put. Uh, you are, of course, entitled to to group them and to say that the claimant says A, B, and C, but that all boils down to the same thing, and therefore you're you're addressing them as one. Uh, you also, I mean. Again, you're not allowed to mischaracterize what they're saying, but you are allowed to strategically think about how the, the, the claimant's presentation of the case, which is necessarily uh, slanted, how you want to redress that in your submissions. Um, so I think the answer is yes, but don't, don't consider yourself bound uh, in an English pleading style to go paragraph by paragraph and say, we deny paragraph 12 and we admit paragraph 13 I think it really is about an analysis of what is their case and then going um, uh, into that and, and attacking the, the jugular, if you will. Thanks very much. It's a good analysis. Um, Conradus, I see you took your hand down again. I don't know if you, you're just waving and saying hi or if you do have a follow up question. Yeah, I do have a question. Sorry that I lowered my hand. Um, <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I had a question that is there a consideration that you used um you used uh evidence from the case file that is let's say you use the procedure order a paragraph in the procedure order or somewhere in the exhibit and let's say that that is the only that is the only thing that you actually use as the authority. Now, does the tribunal have an extent that they consider that they feel like that certain argument where you use that authority, you should have maybe used further, further authorities like case law or any other authorities? Is there such a consideration and that if you want to rely on only evidences such as exhibits or evidences from the procedure orders? 
And I think that uh, there are two different things, right? I think you have your your authorities, which which help you uh, establish what what the law is, what the rule is, and how how that rule is to be applied, and what what facts are are relevant considerations. And then you have the second element, if you will, the second basket, which is all the facts that you use to to make the law work. Um, so I think, you know, again, I think you're not doing one to the exclusion of the other. Um, what you shouldn't do is conflate them. Uh, so you should not be tempted to uh, cite an authority for a factual proposition, like a legal authority. Yeah? So if you if you say something about what the claimant did or what the parties agreed upon or what they did not do, um, your citations for those sort of assertions are all going to be to um, the bundle, the record, uh, the exhibits or the contract or the party's pleadings. They're not going to be to, to some case that happens to be factually similar. Um, so, so make sure that you keep those two things very clean and very separate. Um, where your, your case citations come in again is when you, for example, reason by analogy. So once you've described what this case is like and what happened here and whatever you know, facts are present here, you then say this is precisely like in case X. Uh, so I don't know, when it comes to the stay application, you might say, well, there isn't even a prima facie suspicion here of corruption. It's about different contracts and it's, you know, no allegations that have been made that this particular contract of issue here was tainted by corruption. Uh, and that's a factual assertion. Uh, for that, you would cite to exhibits in the bundle and, and you would you know, you'd make, make sure that you reference that correctly. Now, if you then say in a second step, and you know, in other cases, that's been a decisive or relevant point in that tribunals have refused to stay proceedings when uh, the respondent was unable to even establish a prima facie case of corruption, then in, in that second step, you would of course refer to those cases that you then had in mind. I think that's, that's the, the distinction between the two um, that you would um, want to observe. Thank you very much. I've just posted a well a question on the chat to say that we have space maybe for one more question. Um, the first person to raise their hand wins. So we can do a countdown without the the music that we had during the quiz night. So <laughs> it is a pointing. Yeah. All right. I see no hands. Well, that's fine. Um, I, I think we it's been a quite engaging session and there have been a lot of questions. Um, and we thank you very, very much for your time and your extra time indeed um, for sitting with us for over two hours. Um, so really on behalf of Africa and the Moot and all of the participants, thank you very, very much to Matthias for your time and your insight and your wisdom and your support ultimately in the promotion of uh, young African arbitration practitioners. Um, and we are really appreciative. We hope to, to see you again soon. And again, also, thank you very much to the participants for spending the time on the call as well. I know there are various disruptions in university schedules and power failures, etc. So um, it's great that, that all of you and so many of you could make the time and the effort to be with us. Well, it, it, indeed, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm, uh, um, I didn't even realize we spent two hours here. Um, but probably testament to how energizing I, I find the session. And I am indeed very happy to be able to say that I look forward to seeing you all in real life, hopefully uh, soon or at the latest uh, in Vienna uh, in spring. Um, something we couldn't say for the last two years. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited indeed to hopefully see a real delegation from Africa uh, in Vienna and um, see all of you advance, I'm sure, uh, very far in the competition. Great. Thank you. Well, with that, we can uh, formally close the proceedings. Thank you to Thank everybody. You. Thank you.